Welcome to a conversation with revolutionaries. This is the first of a series of videos surrounding the Chicago City elections starting in February 28, 2023. See the details in the description that accompanies this video on YouTube. This is the most historic election since Harold Washington was elected in 1983. The city of Chicago is again in crisis. Thousands of people are out in the street homeless, unable to get food, unable to get the health care that they need, to get the education that they need to survive or thrive in the way that people in the richest country in the world ought to be able to thrive. That's the situation that faces the people of Chicago. That's what is forcing its way into the electoral campaigns. We have some real possibilities to electing people who can fight for the interests of the working class. And we also have the possibility of building a movement that's based on those fights around the basic needs of the people. How do revolutionaries work within elections and what kind of a movement will exist afterwards. We need that kind of discussion. We need that kind of strategy because we need that kind of action. So I approach this awesome job with pride, pride in my community, pride in the ability of my community to rouse up as though they had been a sleeping giant and to recognize that there is a responsibility that they have that they cannot shirk. Nobody else is going to shoulder that burden. I believe in the powers of redemption, and I simply cannot believe in the God I worship that he would permit us to sit on this earth for 400 years, or rather in this country for 400 years, and suffer the indignities which we have suffered piled time after time, high after high, and so heavy it has almost broken the backs of one of the most powerful people in this world. I can't believe there is no redemption. But that redemption is not going to come out in hatred. It's going to come out in positive attitude toward our fellow man. I represent and you represent the fruit of the loom, the best this world has to offer. We've been through the crucible. We've been through the crucible. And we have come out with strong and powerful tensile strength. We are high and good and moral people. We have no explanations to give to anybody. We don't have to explain our existence. We don't have to explain the thing that we want to a part of the political power of this country not to suppress anybody, but to add our good. We've come into the 1980s with an understanding that we have not just a right, but a responsibility to give the best that we have to a society. We want to give it. Well, uh, I'm only going to say that that uh, that recording, the Harold Washington recording, is something that sets the framework for what we're talking about today. This is the 40th anniversary of the victory of Harold Washington in the election of 1983. It had national consequences. It wasn't just something for Chicago. It actually set the stage for the Jackson campaign of 1988, without which, uh, without and without the Washington victory here in Chicago, that would have been inconceivable. Um, so what I, what I wanna say here is that our discussion with the amazing group of people that we've assembled here to talk about the elections here, the setting the, is based in that framework and in particular the framework set by the, the quote that is always attributed to Harold, it's not the man, it's the plan. And we have two basic things that we're thinking about here. We have a crisis in the city of Chicago around the fight for basic needs, and we have a movement or movements developing around those. And the, and the question that we have to consider through all of what we're talking about is how does that movement get built within an electoral campaign? The second thing we have to consider is how do we continue the movement after the election, after the victory, or after the defeat? Because it could be either one. How does the movement get stronger? So we'll be returning to these kinds of things throughout the presentation. That's what this is about. And we'll now introduce our moderator for the evening is, excuse me, Jesu Estrada. Jesu is a community college teacher, an activist, um, and an, just an amazing revolutionary poet. Uh, I wanna uh, ask Jesu to take over for this part, for the rest of the, the session until we close. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that wonderful, uh, warm introduction. So um, we have a, a good number of speakers and how the format is going to go is that I'm going to ask a question, post in the chat, and then speakers will speak, you know, how they want to. And, and before that, briefly introduce yourself. We have uh, Steve De La Rosa, Nicholas Richard Thompson, Alan Harris, Ethel Longscott, and David Vance. And I don't think I missed anyone. So if you want to introduce yourselves in that order, I'd be happy to hear more about who you are. Uh, Steve, do you want to begin? I just had to unmute, but here I am. Uh, my name is Steve De La Rosa. Um, I'm a Chicagoan by birth. Uh, present live out in the burbs, live in Villa Park. I'm a member of Immigrant Solidarity DuPage based in uh, Wheaton. Uh, a member of Illinois Unidos um, that works to uh, create more uh, ethnic justice uh, throughout the state of Illinois and an elected library board member of the municipality of Villa Park. Um, I want to thank uh, the league for inviting me to participate and look forward to our discussion tonight. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have Nic Nicholas Richard Thompson. Uh, yes, uh, I'll be brief. I'm part of the, the Black Alliance for Peace, which is an anti-war, anti-imperialist and, and pro-peace organization rooted in the Black radical tradition, as well as Indivisible Aurora, which is a, a very hyper-local organization uh, focused on progressive values and uh, really just a part of the, the broader struggle for the complete and total liberation of poor and working class people all over the globe. And, you know, honored to be here tonight with such a decorated guest and hopefully to, you know, add some insight to the, the dis discussion for tonight. Definitely. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Alan Harris. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Harris, and I am from Chicago and um, uh, specifically from the South Side. It's my home. I have uh, been a revolutionary uh, for a very, very long time since um, since I was uh, in high school, at least. Also, um, Harold Washington, I, I actually uh, took part in the Washington campaign back in the back in the 80s. And um, and I can remember uh, seeing him in 1983 in um, in the Civic Center. There was a rally and I went down there uh, seeing him for the first time. And there was something I didn't know what it was I wanted to hear. But I when I heard it, I would know it when I heard it. And I heard it. And he said, he said, when I become mayor, you won't have to fight City Hall, you will be City Hall. And for that reason, he's one of the greatest people. He's one of the best things. He may be the best thing that ever happened to Chicago. Um, it was, uh, he, it was a, it was a plan. It was a movement. It wasn't just the man, but it was a great a uh, great movement and those years when he was mayor and and this was our town it really really um changed it changed chicago forever it was a real break with the past so um anyway i, I i'm happy that that we remember harold here uh, we we should remember him this is the 40th anniversary of his of his election as, as mayor and and in in a real way he's he's still with us he's still with us in in what we do ourselves here now so uh that said thank you and uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, ethel long scott hi everybody i am really uh i bring you greetings from the city of oakland and the state of California. I am so delighted to be a part of a recognition of Harold Washington because with all of your comments, I am reminded that the work that Harold did helped our class to figure out how to straighten up our backs, how to begin to function as thinkers and as the kind of transformative force as a class when we have unity and clarity of purpose. And I think that um, I remember that change. Um, I worked here in California uh, to support and teach about that campaign. And I remember 
how it changed campaigns throughout California. Uh, progressives were running. We got a plan. Now, sometimes they had a plan and no movement and, you know, or, or, or the movements were disunited. But the notion that we could do this a different way, um, Chicago was teaching, I'm trying to tell you. And so this political moment is so crucial and the lessons. So I, um, we've had recent ones here in Oakland to, to share the idea revolutionary thinkers have to both do and think about to secure our goals. So um, I have been involved in the league for all of my adult life. Um, I have had the honor and the opportunity to uh, work with the most um, destitute and dis, uh, disenfranchised um, across this country, uh, but often based out of initially in Los Angeles, initially San Diego, Los Angeles, and then also uh, largely Oakland. And um, I think that this is our time, folks. So I'm really glad that we are mining these lessons. I never saw that video. I could feel cheated somewhat, but I'm really glad that we're sharing those and we need to continue to do that. And I think that that's the spirit that the league is thinking about how do we make the links and provide the confidence and the, um, the wherewithal for these new class forces who must must secure our country from these corporate dogs. Thank you. You're here, sister. Uh, finally, uh, we have David Vance. Okay, <clears throat> well, um, hello everyone. Uh, great discussion topic. Well, who, uh, who, who am I? Um, retired steel worker, USW Local 1010, and I am from Chicago. I participate in a number of organizations, mostly local. The SOAR, Steelworkers Organization of Active Retirees, um, working in a number of local committees. One of them is for a steelworkers exhibit in the Museum of Science and Industry. Um, I'm very active in the issues of the neighborhood schools, local school council at Bowen High School, go to lots of meetings. And yes, there is a neighborhood uh, grassroots movement going on, any number of places, environmental issues, the issues of organizing uh, for more union, uh, more union voices. So the retirees are there. Um, and so I'm uh, interested in, uh, yes, the, the legacy of Harold Washington. I think this is an important discussion. I can't wait to hear the speakers. Thank you. That is a great segue into the first question, which I put in the chat for you speakers. And the way we're going to play it, if you want to answer, go ahead. We don't have to go by turn. Um, just maybe, um, anyway, we'll just continue. So this is the first question. What key issues are the wards and the city, this includes folks from outside Chicago, like Oakland, facing that the city has failed to address? What movements for basic needs do we see developing? And this is particular to Chicago. What is the significance of the police accountability board? Okay, in the interest of not having dead time on the show, I'm gonna jump in here because I think part of that question, the end part of it, uh, talking about the police accountability boards are, that is a, is a huge, uh, facet of a uh, long-term long-term uh, work, I'm just going to call it, uh, instead of uh, trying to frame it as a, a, a super positive um, expialidocious type of curative. I think that the, that the police accountability boards, um, it's like we have to be very certain that that they're not overtaken by members of the Chicago Police Department who are actively working to get on those boards and manipulate the results. I think uh, we need to reach out to our friends and neighbors and, and get them involved in working to support people that they know to get on these boards and to work to make them reactive to the will of the people. If I can go next, and uh, I'd love to echo that. 
So uh, I've worked with CARPER, uh, the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, uh, from the, the onset of, you know, from ECPS and prior to that and what it is uh, and now in the police <laughs> districts. And I, I do think it's historic. I do, get, I do think it's imperative that we focus on uh, securing those seats. But what I do want to say is that I think CARPER took the, the proper way of, of any campaign organization. So a lot of the folks who are involved with it were not previously organizers. It was a very grassroots effort. They went into communities where people were brutalized by the police. They went into communities where people were harassed by the police and neglected and are facing a terrible uh, situations due to deprivation by the city. So they're getting really, really, you know, the, the root of our communities, right? We, we use the word community, but we can't just talk about that and living in proximity, but like share unified values. And they're building people up to be a part of revolutionary movement because as revolutionaries, one of our primary goals should be raising consciousness. And I think Carper has done that. So what's more important, I think, than even the councils is the process in which they got to that. Now, now that we're there, we need to seize that opportunity to take the struggle to the next level, which is securing the public safety commission for sure, and to be able to control the administrative process of the city, a so-called police, but also their budget, the hiring, the firing, the policy. But when we look at the process of how they got there, that is very critical because you know we're not outnumbered, we're definitely out-organized though, right? And when I say by that, that's a quote Malcolm X used, we're out-organized when I'm uh, by the state. The state has their police apparatus, they have their media propaganda, and they have investors in their pocket to fund their process. We have to be able to organize in such a way that we have the same amount of uh, uh, efforts and forces to combat that. So I do think the police accountability, overarching community control of the police is not only historic, but it's unprecedented. It is something that can be a model uh, nationally if it, it can be secured and then operated properly. So I think a lot of people should be focused on that. I would say, I'd even argue Right. Like it, it, it could be something that is even more important than the mayoral races, just due to the fact that the police are what pr protect property capital and are the uh, revenue generators for municipalities. Uh, when you secure public safety and people can stop being harassed and you can start getting resources to these communities, you can start organizing uh, on a higher level. And, you know, I think Carper's done a great job at building the foundation for that. So I think it's up to us, you know, uh, everywhere to talk about it, be about it, hit doors and whatever you can to support that movement. And Nicholas, I think there's like 42 candidates running across the city of Chicago. Some of them young, 21 years old from the um, from the southwest side and other places. I think I think it's really inspiring to see that. You know, sorry, I just had to jump in for a little bit. Um, anybody else on that or, or other questions? Or maybe if you're seeing similar movements like here in Chicago? This is Ethel from uh, Oakland. Is it okay if I chime in to some of y'all shy Ch town experience there? Um, first, I want you to know that we have a hell of a um, revolutionary leader on our city council, Ms. Carol Fife, and she is a daughter of uh, Carol Washington, not the child of, but of this movement from Harold Washington. And her whole approach, not only as a formerly homeless uh, woman uh, with uh, her three kids, but her whole approach to these issues is that uh, put centerfold the issue of getting the women and kids off the streets and into their homes. And of course, that was a part of what helped to inform the uh, organizing, the bold efforts of uh, Moms for Housing. Uh, so the question of housing is a basic need, but also something else you guys in Chicago are familiar with. And that is the battle of, uh, to try and keep these billionaires and multimillionaires from shutting down all of our schools. They use those one, two punches to push a lot of poor folks out of the city of Oakland over the past 15, 20 years. And you've seen the African-American population drop from uh, by about 25% uh, as housing throughout the state of California has gone through the roof. So these basic need pursuits um, has really driven home that we've been up against the hedge funds. We, I mean, we're, it, this isn't simply one uh, property association, though they are there, but th this is, he, uh, them and Wall Street working on so many different levels. So the importance of what, I'm sorry, I don't know all your names, but Mr. Nicholas just said about, we got to have some consciousness that that's got to be driving our efforts as we participate in these electoral efforts um, to, um, to be clear that we are advancing a movement to transform things. But this isn't just about an, an individual candidate. We got candidates now. That we want to we want to win these seats. We're running to win. 
But running to win also means securing, uh, uh, putting a movement in place that is aimed at securing a cooperative society, that is aimed at securing um, what kind of lives do we need to lead. So I, we see that process unfolding in the city of Oakland, the rebellion led by our children uh, in the city of Oakland to stop the school closures that went on for a year. And that was a forerunner to our elections. And we were able to dump the charters, the, the, dump the billionaires running our school board um, and get um, a progressive majority on that school board and on our city council. So the lessons from the um, Carol Washington campaign and the work that you all continue to do is we're actually feeding one another. That should be intentional. That should be, we should build that in a way that helps Can us say something? figure out how do we do these things in a way that um, allows us to move that process forward. And I'm, I'll stop there and let other. Uh, so we're not gonna open up to public forum until the speakers have had a chance to ask the question yet, but hang on to that sister, cause we'll come back to that. Uh, David, you know, Ethel touched on a really important issue that has to do with uh, public education and Chicago is no stranger to schools being shut down. Um, and I don't know, David, if you could speak to the charter situation or, um, you know, because I know you're very active in that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you again. First, uh, I will speak about the police in the schools. They call them school resource officers and uh, led by the CTU. Big demonstrations. Uh, uh, the summer before, the summer of uh, 21. And uh, so there were votes in the local school councils. Um, and I don't have the numbers, but uh, quite, a few not, quite a few schools voted to take, uh, to not have the, the SROs. They, they were given a, a chunk of money to hire uh, trained um, uh, they would use uh, social justice in the school. So that was an important struggle led by the union. Um, at Bowen, no, uh, it, it was uh, a, um, the, um, the parents were all for having, follow, following the principal to have police in the school. So, so that was an issue that is uh, still, still talked about. Can I answer your second question about the charters? Well, wow. it's a, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I'm a mom of two small kids, and you know, yes. uh, near and dear to my heart. I will give you an example. East of the Dan Ryan, ten years ago, seven high schools, and each of those high schools, and Bowen was one, had a thousand to two thousand students. Now today, of uh, twenty three. There are 14 high schools. They've doubled the high schools in the area. Um, so as I, I just drew a circle, east of the Dan Ryan, and now 14 high schools. And so what we have, uh, I like to call it a slow moving train wreck. Uh, so I kind of, uh, uh, a number of schools are down to 100 students, 200 at Bowen, 100 at Hirsch, a number of other historic high schools with 300, whereas, uh, and so being drained um, by this charter movement. Uh, and so now we're gonna have an elected school board coming up, but they have already built in a crisis, taking the money, public money into private hands. And uh, the movement, the candidates, for the, for the office of mayor have spoken up. Um, and so uh, this issue has to be raised more and more by the union and the public. Um, and I'll stop there. Anybody else on this uh, question or should we move on to the next one? We're kind of already touching on it, but we'll on to the next one. All right. And you know, if you want to say something about the previous one, and, and I see people putting comments in the chat, uh, I'll, I'll definitely highlight those once we get to that part. Um, the second question is tied into the first one. And like I said, some of you have already started speaking to this. How do we work within the electoral movement to build the movement for basic needs? This is Kathy Powers. Uh, I, got, I have to say, I have to say uh, basic needs to me mostly comes under public health. And we, we have a very uh, uh, diminished public health system. It's been, uh, it's like 
a fourth of the size it was when Harold Washington was in. I'm involved with the People's Response Network, and I follow it carefully. And uh, yeah, and all these candidates are are talking about how uh, how they're going to address mental health. That's my deal. That's my deal is mental health because I'm as crazy as you can imagine. Uh, they all say how important it is and everything. Do you know we haven't e even had a hearing on treatment, not trauma? I got all, all activists crazy in 2012 when they closed my mental health clinic in Rogers Park. We still don't have a mental health clinic in Rogers Park. The closest one we have is in uh, North River, which is at Pulaski and between Foster and Peterson. It takes me two hours to get there by bus. That's it for the north side. And, you know, Rogers Park is no picnic. And, yeah, everybody complains about the south side. And this is not south side or north side. It's a neglect by the entire city. We don't, you know, this treatment on trauma things, I haven't reopened the clinics. I could go on and on. Big failure, big failure. And I want to see a candidate who will pledge, who will pledge to do what what his his thing and make me believe it. You can pledge all you want, but make me believe it. Make me believe you're going to do something. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I want to echo what Kathy said. So one thing about you know organizing around basic needs, I think it, it needs a multi prong approach. And one of those approaches, right, is in our communities. Right, there are tons of mutual aid programs going on all throughout Chicago. I believe consolidate consolidation and communication and coordination between these efforts are important. But more importantly, we should codify these things through the city. The peace book that has been put forward by Good Kids Mad City, I think is an excellent example of that. I think it could go even further. I think it'd be expanded upon. But with that, right, if you secure a public safety commission with police district councils, with revolutionaries and organizers and people on those, you can determine what public health and public safety is. Right. So you can say it's substance use. You can say it's mental health. And then money from the police department goes to that. Money from incarceration goes to community. Money that goes from the police goes to people. So again, that's why I say it's historic, it's important. And I don't know if we're missing at times, because I've heard some, some people in other circles not see the importance of it. It literally can be, you could call it a Trojan horse, into seizing actual state power to be able to do what we want to do, right? I, I still say we need to have our mutual aid programs and focus on that because that's where a lot of the mass organizing comes from. But if we can see state power, why wouldn't we, right? That's the focus, I think, of every serious revolutionary, right? We need to take care of our communities and or organize around day-to-day -day <laughs> needs and get people what they need for survival. But long-term, we should be seeking use the electoral process when we can. And this is one of the few moments when we can, because usually electoral politics is a sham, but this is one of the few moments where it can be something very serious. So, you know, I, I, I'll yield my time after that. Beautifully said, thank you. Anybody else want to jump in on that question? How do we work within the electoral movement to build a movement for basic needs? I'd like to speak to that if it's okay from Oakland again. Um, I think that both Kathy and Nicholas really hit the nail on the head. Um, what we uh, did here in our, our most recent election, um, Moms for Housing, a group of, of both uh, bold, <laughs> formerly unhoused and um, uh, just to, you know, just very focused leaders uh, did was they hosted candidates forums. And we had an unusual situation in Oakland and that of um, seven or 10 candidates, three had formerly been homeless. Um, some as young as 20 years old, 20, 22, 23 years old, and some um, older, some were still homeless as they were running those campaigns. And our actually our, our elected mayor that uh, exists now um, was homeless with her kids um, before. That is uh, the first, you know, they, often they'll talk about being the first Hmong, but she also owns it about having been uh, a person who had been um, of, of formerly um, uh, homeless and sleeping in her car with her children. And that really changed the tenor of things, y'all. We didn't have to, you know, uh, debate. You know, it was front and center. So how could we, uh, the question of housing, and, and then the moms were not mealy mouth. Their question was, how are we going to solve this problem? And we women, we moms, have a proposal for solving this. So that really put front and center the question of the movement issue, as well as the question of, um, ensuring that impacted leaders are, are, are at the center of this process. 
Another thing that we really also had in our favor or that we tried to utilize, but when I'm saying these things to you, I don't want you to think that everything was hunky-dory, everybody agreed with everything. No, in the school board race, there were good people who were at odds, fighting each other like dogs. There were good people in the mayoral effort, but what with the moms sponsoring that um, mayoral forum, they set the tone for what was the discussion in the movement, even that the movement would be a priority as in this electoral piece. But the other thing um, we that came out of the uh, this process was the development of a progressive slate. And yes, someone I saw somebody put in the chat um, with the role of ranked choice voting. If you got to use every tool you got. <laughs> I think what Nick is talking about, you know, we don't have the luxury of saying, oh no, we you know, we're just that that's too low for us. No. Each of these processes needs to be a school between revolutionary transformation of uniting leaders together who are about that business, others who are at a different spot. We can respect that, but some of us got to be paying attention to that process. And so what the progressive slate did is that it affirmed both values and measurable goals so that we knew that the charters were running their candidates both in the school, obviously in the school race, but also in the mayoral race. So we had to affirm those goals. We can get in front of this. And I'll tell you, even if your election is tomorrow, this is important to do now. So what we found is that that process helped us in terms of establishing what marks a win. Don't let our, don't let our enemy define what makes a win. We, the people who have been impacted, have to define that. And then lastly, as a result, um, Again, this this um, she, it's more than a firebrand. Carol Fife, um, she led our city in putting forward three ho bold housing initiatives that would provide twenty six thousand new units of extremely low income housing. Hasn't been done in decades in Oakland, probably in your city either. Um, and the public voted to support them. Surprise, surprise, surprise. So now, they, of course, the hedge funds and media are saying, oh, Oakland's too broke. It can't do social housing. Oh, no, it can't happen. That's a lie. We know what they're doing. But that's why we have to put our political education in place as we are doing this. So I'm sorry to yabber, yabber. But I'm just saying we're, we're setting up for, we know we got to battle this through. It's not going to be, they're not going to give us one inch, y'all. The way that Harold talked about that in that opening, we got to be ready for how do we fight forward with the, the, these ideas have to lead in our work. And when that happens, it positions us to have those as the struggles in the way that Kathy was talking. And basic needs is all of those things, healthcare, housing, uh, education, the, our people to have, you know, um, decent food. Um, you know, we have freezing damn rains here in California and we've got people outdoors all up and down the damn state. Um, places that have been burned out, people drowning and all that stuff. So I think that it is imperative that we build unity. And that's the other thing that we've, built. we've been, you know, how do we move that from just a general concept? And so we people on this call have to be the ones leading and defining that process. I'll shut up with that. Thank you, that was beautiful. Uh, there's been a request, Steve, to maybe speak to the situation with uh, uh, refugees and I'm um, sorry, go back up. Uh, asylum seekers, migrants, and that are coming to Chicago, and how how people are responding in the community to to the displacement and incarceration of people. I know this is happening everywhere. I work for the city colleges of Chicago, and they have um, a like a camp with uh, private security, but nobody knows what the conditions are like in there. You know, um, so I, I anyway, Steve, do you think you could speak to that? What the conditions are for asylum seekers? Well, I can. I can tell you that that out where Immigrant Solidarity DuPage does its main body of work and we're basically uh, a labor related organization that does cultural events and uh, does food drives, uh, uh, does uh, um, COVID campaigns in terms of inoculations for the, for the community. All that's changing now because We've defeated COVID, don't you know? And 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 COVID is 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 basically going to miraculously uh, uh, turn to daylight because we've been in the nighttime with COVID, and now it's going to daytime. And the three to four hundred people that are dying every day across the country are going to 
become some other kind of entities besides the life forms that they turn into when they do pass. I think it's frightening that, uh, that uh, the, the nation's palette is being painted as, okay, it's like we've defeated COVID. And when the reality is, is that no, we haven't defeated COVID and people are still getting sick, especially in the marginalized communities of people of color. And it's the, the immigrants and, and, and our black brothers and sisters that, that are, are seeing the brunt of the deaths still happening. And that could change if there was a different viewpoint of how people are treated and respected as being human beings in this country. I think we got a long way to go. And I think, you know, like uh, with the, to come back to the mayoral election, none of the candidates here in Chicago are talking about using the TIF monies that are, that are, are, are warehoused in banks that are well connected to the people who are running for office, who basically are providing ways for banks to reloan this TIF money to make more money on the money that came from Chicago's own, uh, through Chicago's own developments. And we need, to we, need to, we need to hold these candidates accountable. We need to ask them, why don't you take some of that half a billion dollars worth of TIF money and use it to do something positive for the economically depressed areas where immigrants are being placed as well as community members who live in these economically depressed areas and give them, give them some community development so that they can have some way to get a piece of that half a billion dollars that's being warehoused and not being thought of because they don't wanna let it go. It's, it's no, you don't have to be a, a, a rocket scientist to figure out that, oh, that if we got $500 billion in the, $500 million in the bank, we're not gonna let it go because we're able to make a lot of money off of that. Just the interest alone on that gives us a good way to generate income for the city and not have to put it on the books. So I, you know, I, I, I guess that's what I wanna add to this discussion about it at this point in time. Awesome, thank you. Alan, we haven't heard from you. Do you wanna jump in here or should we go to the next question? Oh, okay, right, just on the tips. Uh, that actually has something to do with uh, um, the Washington period because that's when they were created. And I, if, if Harold was here now, uh, I think he would be shocked at, at, at what, it's, what has happened. Um, that was exactly, just as um, uh, Mr. De La Rosa pointed out, the purpose of TIFs was for, um, basically for uh, funding of, of reinvestment in the neighborhoods here in Chicago. But uh, what's happened uh, since then is that it's turned into a, a slush fund and it's a slush fund for the rich. Uh, a great example is um, just uh, one example of uh, TIF money being um, uh, a slush fund is that it was used to um, you know, build a uh, Hyatt Hotel here on the south side in, in Hyde Park, you know, um, they, they do that, um, all kinds of, um, all kinds of other uh, high-end fancy, uh, fancy projects uh, here in Chicago, usually downtown or, or somewhere um, uh, in some other part of the city, and it's, it's all used, uh, it's just, it's just used as, as a slush fund, you know. Uh, we don't get, the rest of us, we don't uh, get anything from it. Um, so that's, that's, an, that's an, uh, an ongoing sore point here, here in Chicago. And it's, it's really one of the, um, uh, it's, it's really one of the uh, big battles that, uh, that we're having. Thank you. So we're actually okay. a little over time, but I say we, if it's okay with you panelists, maybe give it 10 minutes before we break, because there's a couple questions left. 
Um, and, and you've touched on this already, but how, how do we emerge at the end of um, the electoral campaign with a stronger movement? I don't know Ethel has spoken to, it's gotta happen now, but how, how do we do that? I think that for people to think about the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, like that's our stick. Um, every day working on these hard fought battles that, are, that our, our people need in order to live. This is, this is the space we're in but also with the idea of a vision that we, you know, the time is now for the kind of change. And so we got to go into these campaigns with that idea. You know, there are some of our organizations who are going to be doing the door knocking in the way that um, Mr. Richard and, and also Mr. De La Rosa have talked about. Uh, and there's going to be others who are going to be doing the other kind of incredibly uh, important work, but that work of political education uh, to secure the goals the, the transformation, the gathering of those leaders who are about the business of transformation. Not everybody is, but in the league we are. We proudly uh, have that space. We have lots to learn, but we also have something to offer in that process. And so I think if we think about, not only are these are opportunities for schools for revolution, but they are opportunities to gather those people uh, that are the Washington, the heroes, I mean, the millions that were touched in that campaign uh, and that, you know, gave someone like, um, <laughs> I remember uh, ministers talking about uh, early on, you know, they told uh, Jesse Jackson, well, just threaten to run. They didn't know he was actually going to run, but also the movement, you know, drafted him because people needed that. Uh, that's an important thing. And so I think we operate as revolutionaries with a sense of both history and a sense of science and a sense of how these pieces come together, um, this space, we need that. Not everybody's gonna be embracing that. So there'll be some who are saying that, you know, let's just work on this or that little aspect and that's okay. Somebody is gonna be tending to that big picture. Somebody's tending to transformation. And that's, that's the space that the League of Revolutionaries of for a New America, that's what we, we hang out there. That's our, and, and, and we wanna, Make sure that there's space for anybody else who's about that business. We can handle that together. Right on, Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to continue that. I, I feel at times I've seen electoral, you know, campaigns uh, unfortunately take a loss and then people drop out. Uh, we got to ask ourselves serious questions. Are we serious about a process? Are we serious about long-term revolution? Because it's not a campaign. I'll be honest with you. Even if you got your favorite candidate, the struggle has to continue because that candidate now needs support. So we have to stop dropping off. We have to stop being so, you know, uh, word of Miriam Kaba, hope is a discipline. You know what I'm saying? So is the will. We got to be willful in the struggle. Even if you got the best candidate, right? If that person exists, you still have to struggle. You can't go home after that, right? And I don't think revolutionaries do that, but the liberals, the progressives tend to do this. But as revolutionaries, how do we build organization to ensure folks can pour into those after that? I think organization is the answer. I think the answer often lies in other and collectivity. And if we're not collectivized and we don't have organization, we can't exercise power. So I think a prerequisite to running a campaign, a prerequisite for a sustained struggle is organization. So that's always my focus. You know, when, I, when I'm talking to folks, I'm like, you in an organization? Why not? Right. Find one. Right. There's a lot of revolutionary organizations. This being one that folks can get in and start collectivizing and start strategizing, building tactics supporting basic needs every day and also having those other multi-prone approaches that I spoke about earlier. The electoral process is not the end goal, but it's the utility, right? Kwame Tari tells that he says this, and that's one of my mentors. He said, I gave my blood for the right to vote, but I never voted. It was a means to organize my people. So see the electoral process is something more than just the end goal, but a process, right? To galvanize people who are apolitical, to galvanize people who perhaps aren't on uh, in alignment with you, but perhaps can be one day. We got to see it as a process and, and gain as much as we can from it and learn from the loss. If we are to lose, why did we lose? Let's learn from it. Were we really immersed in the masses? Were we addressing their needs? Were we door knocking hard enough? Because if we lost, yes, the fight is insurmountable at times, right? It might seem like that, but the reality is we have more people. So when we're losing, we got to learn from those. And if we're learning from those and we're building an organization, and I, and I truly believe this, and we're, we're working collectively in unity, like Ethel said earlier, I don't believe, right, anything, you know, can stop, you know, the, the working class, poor people from taking and seizing power. So I think the electoral process is important. But it is a utility. It is a tool. We have to understand how and when to use that tool. Uh, very similar to the ballot or the bullet. And you know, right now, I think it's an excellent time to utilize the ballot 
and go out there and vote for police district councils, securing community control of the police, and getting uh, Lori uh, Lightfoot not only out of the mayorship, but out of the city of Chicago, hopefully. Amen, brother. I couldn't have said it better. Um, yeah, you're getting lots of applause from everybody else. You know, I think that's a good segue because I don't want to keep you too much longer because we're almost at eight o'clock. Um, and I know people have posted questions in the chat. So c considering the possibilities of the elections, good and bad, what do we do if the outcome is very bad? And I do want to say one thing about Chicago politics. We have so many progressive older persons that are running. Um, imagine if they win all of them together, we could we could make a difference. We could change things. But what if things don't go our way? And I know people have been digging on Paul Vallis and whatever. What if we get another another mayor that's worse than Lori in office? That's a bummer of a question, but I think it's important. <laughs> It um, part of the problem is is the way these elections are set up nowadays. Uh, back, you know, we talk about how um, well, we talk about 1983 and what happened back then, and uh, how the how the Washington movement succeeded, and it um, it really uh, that whole period was a was a great lesson to me uh, in terms of uh, unity because it was it was um, it came at a time when actually the machine itself had split there was a huge falling out between Jane Byrne and um, Rich Daly uh, who was a state's attorney at the, at the time uh, they apparently they they hated each other and um, and as a result um, you know, every the party split. You know, the uh, machine split, and and this opened up an opportunity. Everybody uh, saw the saw the chance now that to to actually win, and so basically, it, Washington won in that primary. It was a three three way race. And uh, and Washington prevailed. He just uh, he uh, came in first. Um, that kind of has a bearing on what we what we have now. They changed the way the elections are run here in Chicago. Um, they're not really based on on the party primary anymore. You just simply have um, uh, a one election, and if no one. Uh, one election with uh, multiple candidates, and if uh, no one gets an outright majority, then they go to a runoff. But um, the way what that has done is that it has given us um, under this system, it has given us Rich Rich Daly, and then it gave us Rahm Emanuel, and now uh, Lori Lightfoot. Um, what makes it hard? to to run and win a citywide election here in Chicago as opposed to a ward election is is money um, the the thing that was uh, common to Daly Rahm Emanuel and and Lori Lightfoot was that they all had money behind them and um, the other uh, drawback of course is you know when we have our elections we have our elections in the winter time and um, you know that kind of uh, tends to suppress suppress the vote um, citywide, especially in the in the poor community communities. Whereas in '83, uh, everybody was energized across the board. But if if you don't have um, if you don't have um, uh, an election that um, people can see a chance. To, to make a difference in by voting, well then the tendency is to is to not vote, um, and and so there there's just, the conditions that that we're having this campaign in this year aren't aren't exactly ideal, they're a little bit less than ideal, and uh, one of them uh, being the the way the election is structured, um, and the other is is the is the multiple candidates we don't have just one um one candidate that everybody gets behind you know in the progressive movement we have we have several uh several progressive candidates and um and and several several different campaigns and 
um, the, this, the discouraging news in the last few days is, is, uh, is uh, have it has to do with one of these candidates. Uh, in fact, we've mentioned him already. I'm not going to mention him, mention him again, but you know who I mean. Um, he's um, not only does he have the backing of the police, but it's now turning out that uh, the business establishment here in Chicago is getting behind him as well. And, you know, the danger uh, looking forward to February 28th is that is the very thing that we're, you know, discussing in this question. We end up with, we end up with a runoff in April that nobody really cares about, you know, and, and that is uh, most, uh, most disheartening. If that happens, and if um, someone, if Lori or someone as bad or worse than her, if, if such a thing is possible, um, gets elected, um, I just hope, I, I, well, it, it just means that we'll have to regroup and uh and and come back again at the next cycle there are several more cycles until we we vote again in 2027 there's 2024 we, we're going to have to keep pushing but but hopefully my hope is that you know when we do strike again we're we unite we unite um if we unite the the enemy will split but if if we split, the enemy will unite. And so we have no choice, you know, we, we must unite. I, I, I kind of strayed from the question, but, um, but uh, it does kind of have a bearing on, 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 um, on the question here that we're talking about. So anyway, I'll, uh, I'll end it right there. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so we're actually at the wonderful time we can hear a cultural performance. And, and Nicholas is going to lead that for us. <clears throat> yes, I actually wrote this piece at the League's Cultural Conference. And at first I was going to write something new, as I always try to do. But this piece still just, I think, resonates for the time because it is a love letter to revolutionaries, rebels, radicals, renegades, and rabble-rousers and rancators toward a vision of a future struggling to be born. Humanity was stopped for no man's privilege. I'm early morning reading hood communists and drinking matcha on the porch, on look in the community garden where my children play safely. Murals de uh, decorated in liberatory illustrations, the catchphrase is everyone always, from each according to ability to each according to need, down with imperialism, a black alliance for peace. I pull up to the district assembly discussing city allocations and the preservation of the trees. Everybody's heard and everybody speaks. Onward, ever, backward, never, we delivering groceries to the senior co-op. I receive a round of chess with elders picking up game and some recipes. They share it with me that revolution was a process, not an end goal or a thing, but in motion and always becoming. The struggle continues. Child care is collective. A well-being for all was a platform. Pigs wasn't welcome on the block. Safety was our bonds with each other. I'm at the community center volunteering time, pondering if Huey P. Newton read the Stoics, wondering a world in which Malcolm lives to see Burkina Faso under Sankara. I'm prepping my notes for the book club tonight. There's blood in my eye, hoping to do George Jackson justice. I'm strolling through the neighborhood, stop on the corner cooperative in a hoodie and a do-rag. This is a spot where we plant the coup at. Conniving with a couple convicts turned comrade. I'm checking in on my folks walking down the street where the people in control. No cop cars on patrol. We quicker to revolt than to vote, and they know that. Blacks and brown babies no more in blues. Journey the grace of men amusements. Riding bikes, flexing and frolicking, hooping and hoping. Ain't no active shooters, only active imaginations. Take them on an adventure, prepping for their next stage of life, unbothered. Blaring boisterous music, playing a dozen, sleeping serenely if they want to. Praising the gospel, ghetto or otherwise. Eating rainbows and sipping dollar sweet teas. Not playing with pistols. This ain't even a utopia, but we got sense enough to know life can't be refunded. I walk in a classroom where I mentor today, teens meditating, hearing the history of the indigenous inmate and the immigrant practicing conflict resolution. They got options for electives like cultivation, world building, writing people's constitutions, hearing voices, seeing visions toward a transformed future. 
History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes and the rhythm hinders movement. But the people's chorus sings Whitey on the moon again. And we sent him there on a one way flight. Do not return to sender. The revolution wasn't televised, it was streamed, streamlined, and made a TikTok challenge. Overthrow the boss today. Form an organization or a party and dance a freedom jig, a two step towards liberation. Protest the progressive only seeking health care. Tell them they way too passive. I'm sorry, but my people keep weapons and we need action. We're not kneeling with no enemies, no infatuation with violence, but our emancipation and sovereignty inseparable from it. Hashtag. First day at the victory, we secured bread for the masses. We acknowledged the land by returning it to the stewards and found equity when we emptied the penitentiaries. We slid on the ruling class, took the power from the sliding scale. Strikes had us thinking of the worker and not drones. I organized as if the revolution tomorrow prepared to work without ever seeing the fruits of my labor because this is for posterity. Leo, Navi, Amiri, Zaire, Zay, the struggle wasn't born in a vacuum and ideas do not fall from the sky. The social context got us here. We put an end to culture wars and woman planets, stolen wages, increasing panic. We built toward mutual aid and dual power. No one being can right all of humanity. That's the people's post. The capital was a catapult. Wasn't no more foundations built on the back of the exploited. No philanthropy or charities. We redistributed the needs from the source. Relations of the property wasn't made obsolete. We in the moment. Post-revolution where I could practice veganism and pacifism and peace where the social conditions can allow for the free association, forming unions with Asada's daughters and sons of Malcolm and the free children, free children. Democracy died with the price tags and war and prison-based economies got millions into suffering. White supremacists and fascists choked them out with their white hoods and bootstraps. If this too graphic, a vivid illustration of world immersion, you ain't built for this. The violence to slave apply is contrary from the slave master. I saw self-determination in the fire of that municipal building. Ironic, it's a community kitchen and warming center now. Communing with my ancestors, wanting to commute to late stage intercommunalism, learning anti-colonial struggles and nation building from the continent and resistance and resilience from the Caribbean. No more prayers, but payments for Haiti. We had a conference off the coast, my people, herbalists and animists. One with earth and phenomena, movers and shakers, druids and shamans and scientists and griots and singers of the freedom songs. Flashbacks to the encampments where we made enchanting with nooks and crannies, had systems of accountability and even light and running water out in the woods, way more civilized than the so-called liberal democracy that deprive us and is the foundation of fascism and enable these neo-confederates. Our zone was liberated. Now them same folks built a commune radically inclusive. I spend weekends there at the open mics. We democratize society and socialize production, built people centered human rights from struggle, a counter to the myth of enlightenment, a world where everything produced ethically and community provided all necessity, whether any working class slave or a peasantry. It was theory into practice, require strategy and tactics. We have no luxury of time nor academic disputes or battling tendencies or Western chauvinism. Our victory is synonymous with unity. I pen this love letter to revolutionaries, rebels, radicals, renegades, rabble routers, and ran couturers. The struggle is ours and the world is dying to be born. What the fuck you gonna do? Man's on fire. God damn, love that's it. beautiful. And <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of love in the chat. And people want your contact information because they can't find you on Facebook, brother. So um, we're actually at the time now where we can open up public comment. We are a little over time. We're at 8-11. But I think the conversation is going. So uh, does anybody have a question for the panelists? No TikTok, Nicholas? <laughs> what? No, all right. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Yolanda. I know you wanted to speak earlier. Do you want to ask your yeah. question? Yeah, I'm at the show because I know how I want to comment. But I have three questions. One is here in San Francisco, a lot of times we have countless progressives running for mayor and none of them won because all the votes were split. And then the, the other thing is, what do you, so what, what do, you, do you think that's a possibility? Because when I was reading an article about it, and uh, I know that you guys said there's a lot of progressives running for mayor for other offices, so I hope they don't split the vote. And the other one is, what do you say to people that that, that are left wing and without disorder and, and don't want to participate in elections? and uh, the, the only last thing I wanted to say is I've been reading, I read a reconstruction article, I read about four articles on rally comrades today, and I know that uh, uh, the rally comrades has been talking about the contradiction between the private ownership of the means of production and the public necessity, and that's something we have to address. So how do you address that in politics where a lot of people just want to know about the 
politicians, the candidates' positions, and how do you work towards those kind of conversations? Okay, I think I caught all your questions. Just correct me, Yolanda. I got, do you think progressives can win without splitting the vote? And I'm assuming it's like in, in wards where there are a number of progressives. Mm -hmm. right? That no, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then the then nobody, not many the progressives win when there's a lot of progressives. And then the, the next question is, what do you say to people that don't want to participate in elections? And I don't know if you want to rephrase that third question. I missed it a little bit regarding the rally. Yeah, um, yeah. That that I I've been re I read rally comments every time it comes out. Today I read the article on reconstruction was very scary. But uh, also, I, I, I was just wondering, I've, I've been reading about the contradictions between the private ownership of the means of production and the social needs and how we have to address that. So when you're talking with candidates, I, I mean, not with candidates, but with the people, even the candidates, how do you bring it, that into the conversation, the fact that, it's, that we're never going to get housing for the homeless for that house because of the contradiction of the private ownership of the means of production and which is only for a few in the social needs of the public which is for everybody how do you bring that into the political discussions when you're conducting the the elections campaigns beautiful okay i think i got them all all right that's a and kudos for reading the rally um i, I think i'm going to post those links in a little bit but who wants to take this question or a series of questions and if you need me to i can repeat them again can I start? If somebody from Chicago, Chi Town, please jump in. Y'all, uh, first of all, Nicholas gave us a map. There's, uh, at least I'm gonna try and utilize it as part of my map, um, in terms of both, you know, uh, making sure that we are teaching as we fight, uh, making sure that in, in each of these battles that we enter into, we uh, keep that sense of what's the big vision of what we're trying to get done, and even at, and, and we meet people where they're at not start with where we want them to be. Uh, so I think that to me, there are many things that Brother Nicholas's poem communicated, but those are key parts. I think, why is that important? Because though we are highlighting the question of, uh, in this particular uh, dialogue or conversation of the value of elections, we are well aware a huge number of people have, have already said, I'm outie. This, don't count me in on this. And uh, we need to make sure, and certainly as a revolutionary organization, we have tried to work on in a multifaceted manner. And again, Nicholas spoke to that so well early on in his comments. And so I think that this isn't a, a, a one or the other, but a both and. and. And then based on that participation, what is the, what is the value of, um, what, 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 that we operate with a sense of purpose? So I think these questions that you have raised okay. means that we've got to uh, work in that manner. But there's a couple other lessons that we can learn from the midterms. We saw in the midterms that the corporations, billionaires and multimillionaires, they tried to convince the working class, y'all ain't going to win. Y'all need to sit your butt down because it's either y'all women want, you know, some uh, autonomy over your bodies or you want to be able to buy eggs or you want to be able to have gas. And guess what? Our class figured out we need both of those things. And in fact, they did not buy, they did not go for the okie doke. So that's why this role of political education is so crucial. And I think that that's what Brother Nicholas demonstrated just now in a twofold manner. And yes, we're yes. usually going to have scoundrels running. Uh, it's taken us like 20 years to go from, you know, Black entrepreneurs running for uh, who would win, run and win these doggone seats here in Oakland to having a majority progressives that are pro-renters, pro-housing rights, et cetera. But we have to advance those values um, based on what our people need, not based on who's ideologically right or wrong, but based on what our people need to live. And that's gotta be front and center. I'm sorry, I'm passionate about these things because I know okay. that these things change. If, if we have a sense of purpose and we operate, you know, with answers to the kind of key questions that you've raised, Yolanda. I don't mean to hog it. I'm going to make sure that somebody else gets to speak to this as well. Beautiful. Somebody else want to speak to these questions? We have a, a, a few other people on the stack still. I see you, Peter and Lou. Okay, Peter, why don't you go ahead, ask your question and, and uh, um, go ahead. Well, actually, um, I wanted to to jump in first on on Yolanda's question. What about people who don't who are, are not going to engage engage in electoral work? I I Gil Scott Heron's voice echoes in my head. Nobody can do everything. Everybody can do something. And what Nicholas said earlier is really important. 
Don't be alone. Find a collective, find a group, be a part of it. It, it you know, my wife is an artist and, and I'm an artist and nothing I do in, in my sculpture is political. It's all pure geometry, but I integrate with others and at art shows, we're talking politics because they're all hungry. You know, so, but second, and a number of the panelists engaged on this really well. What do we, uh, the, the last two questions, how do we emerge with a stronger movement? And what about, what if the election doesn't come out well? Well, we have to understand and we have to share with the people around us that none of this is about a single election. The issues are huge. We are up against this gigantic machine, but this machine has reached the end of its useful life. It has nothing to offer any human being anymore. And so everything we do, electoral or, or you know, neighborhood campaigns, raises the ante in this giant poker game, and the stakes are huge. And so if we win an election, it raises the ante, because it, I worked on the school board election here in Oakland, and now that we won the school board election, the press and the behind the scene actors are jumping in and and cutting the knives are out, baby, you know, and they're they're telling us, oh, you got it. Now you got to keep those schools open with the money you got because there ain't no more money. Well, how there get to be no more money? We need we need to talk about um. the history of this. So uh, they raise the ante. We raise the ante. We have to be prepared for what they're going to do next. And, and we do that by talking together and raising our consciousness. Because like Nicholas said, like Ethel said, like Steve said, um, Alan said, it is about consciousness. And, and, and we got to be in this for the long run because one election ain't going to do it. And if we, if we get somebody good elected, but we don't have a stronger movement, we haven't won anything. I agree with, I'm sorry to jump mm -hmm. in. I agree with that 100%, Peter. I mean, let's say when I mean, we get a progressive mayor, progressive, all the persons, they're still gonna need the people to back them. You know, um, it, it can't help but be. Kathy, go ahead and post your, your question on there if it's not about Citizens United. Um, Lou, uh, you're you're on stack next and then we'll come back to, to Kathy. Um, I had two things to say. Uh, first thing is, just to indicate or give an example of why one election is not enough or an election is not enough. Harold Washington won 40 years ago. Where are we today? Where are we today? After that historic victory, which, and I do not want to at all, at all diminish the importance of that victory, but we as a movement did not take care of the follow-up to that. And so that's, that's why it's important for us to be strategizing and tactically talking today. The second thing I wanted to approach is that this is a time to be audacious. This is not a time to be conservative. This is a time to think boldly about what's possible. And so in response to Yolanda, one of the things that I think is really important to understand, and Nicholas approached it in some of his commentary, is there are two prongs to this. One is that there is no uh, battle that is going on for basic needs today that is objectively separate from any other battle. That is to say, if you're talking about homelessness, you're also talking about education. How many homeless people, you know, are are in schools and trying to and, and can't do well in schools because they didn't sleep well because they didn't have a place to sleep the night before. And if you're talking about food insecurity, aren't you also talking about education? And if you're, you know, and, and so forth and so on. If you're talking about schools, you're also talking about the school to prison pipeline. And you're talking about mass incarceration. And the next thing you know, you're talking about police killings. So they're all, everything is intimately connected today in a way that it was only theoretically connected 50 years ago. So that's the first prong. But the second prong in terms of this question of private uh, property 
and <laughs> you know and public uh, property is that each one of those issues is a gateway from private property to to public. Why the hell should there be massive corporations owning all the housing in this country and keeping it empty? It's time for the government to take the damn things over. And time for us to be able to raise those kinds of questions because we need a government which will take care of the people. So that, you know, and obviously, I mean, there are things, there are much more, you know, there are many more obvious things than that, but that's, I mean, public health is, you know, uh, Kathy talked earlier about the mental health clinics and the, the, the city took an aggressive position of destroying our public health system, particularly the mental health public system. Well, and, and, and turning stuff over to private entities. So isn't it right for us when we're talking about public health and mental health to talk about this is not the role for more pharmaceutical companies to make more money. This is the time for us to take that shit over, for us to, for, for those corporations to become public, because what we're talking about, healthcare, is a public utility. And we really have to be passionate about these kinds of questions, because I think they all do lead to that. And I'm done. Yeah. Whew, don't get me going, brother, because that's... It's a hot mess. Um, Kathy, go ahead. Say, speak, speak your mind, sister. Listen, Lori Lightfoot. Lori Lightfoot and the youth in the city. She imposed a six o'clock curfew that yeah. children couldn't be at the bean after six o'clock unless they were pro properly uh, uh, escorted by an adult. Now, really, really, that's only enforced if you are a, a child, a person of color. She also uh, lowered the curfew to 10 o'clock at night otherwise. Yet, yet she had the audacity, talk about audacity, Lou, audacity to send out uh, requests to teachers at CPS, at the city colleges, to have the students work for her on her campaign. These children who don't have a right to the, the city because she has so decreed. I've written poetry about this. And anybody who wants to have me in an open mic, I have a million of them. And you love them all. And they're all awful, just like she is. I, you know, oh, my God. And then I think, you know, they're doing an investigation about that. And they're not going to come up with a, a ruling about it until after the election. Because, you know, God forbid she wins the election and they've come down on her. So it's not going to happen. Nothing happens in the city without her say so. And don't be, don't be fooled that it works otherwise, because it doesn't. We have five mental health centers left in the city of, of what, uh, what's it now, three plus million? I don't know. People keep leaving, so who knows? <laughs> um, she's taken all of the money that that's been uh given given to the city for for mental health purposes and she has privatized it she's giving it to uh all, all of the uh um non -for, non for profits private organizations so you don't even know you can't find out what they're doing with it because you can't FOIA them you can't FOIA a private organization that's outrageous. That's just outrageous. And it's our tax money. And, uh, you know, most you, there's some places that we did. We did a little bit of uh, research on it. There are some places that are getting mental health money that don't even give mental health services. So, you know, all this stuff, these backdoor done deals, this has got to end. This has got to end. And, uh, I, you know, I'm old, but I have a few years left of me, and I'm not going to shut up about it, and I'm going to write about it, and uh, if I'm not in a major depression, which sometimes I get in, and I don't do anything at all, but I think about these things, even if I'm stewing in my bed and I can't move, I think about it, and I come up with a poem sometimes, and sometimes I just keep stewing on it. I'm not letting it, I'm not 
letting it affect me. I, I, I just see, I just see all of the stuff going on and I run into people, oh, Lori Lightfoot, oh, she, she's a black woman, a, 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 a gay, she's gay and she's wonderful because she became mayor and like, well, yeah, but what has she done since she's been mayor? I could tell them a few things. I, you know, I, I just, I'm just livid about her. I'm livid about her. Paul Vallis, you know, I, I I'm not even saying his name. I, I'll go with, with Alan. I'll just go with Alan about him. Uh, I, I like, I like Brandon Johnson. I like Jamal Green because they all speak to neighborhoods and community and what we need. Certainly not what the corporations need. So they, on, there, there on, is our battle. That's our battle. And uh, I'm I'm a big talker, obviously. And I'll talk to anybody. Today I was at uh, my eye doctor's and I was telling them about the uh, elected police board, which they hadn't heard of at all. They hadn't heard of it at all. And I think most of the people in Chicago haven't. What I've done in the chat here, I put in... Uh, Two links to uh, um, re research your, uh, your your police board candidates because we got the FOP group and the people who have been damaged by and hurt by the system and their families and everything. We want them in because we want reform. Really, you can't reform a broken system. We need a whole new thing. And I, you know, I hope we do it right. And I'm going, you know, I got got to keep talking about it. Also in the chat, I put a link to the map of the police district. So you know what district you're in, you don't have to look, read all of them, although it's kind of interesting to read them. But you don't have to read all of them, find your district, and uh, then check out the candidates. One's from the reader and one is from, um, I already forgot, um, oh, the tribe, which that's that's like my go-to source that that and Southside Weekly I like that too a lot so then then of course it's the People's Tribune listen guys we got a paper out there for for the people in the struggle and uh you know I can't promote it enough uh I don't I I, I <laughs> so talk to people talk to people talk to people don't give them an argument. Listen to them. Listen to the people. Start start a conversation and listen to them because they'll guide the way. The people will always guide the way. I'm finished. I'm finished. Kathy, I didn't know that's where that came from. That's amazing. So, I, you know, I, I agree with Kathy, with, with Lori. I don't even know how many, and not just to the People's Response Network, but all the positive legislation that we've been trying to pass has, has never even gotten out of committee. You know, and so it's just difficult when you have a mayor like that. You can't get anything done, you know. Well, that's not necessarily true, but um, uh, up up next is uh, Sim Simmerjit. I, I probably butchered your name, but uh, you, you're on stack. Oh, thank you. Um, it's Simmerjit. And, you know, like, I think one of the things that just has stuck out in this conversation is that, like, my entry into the conversation came from Ethel, and it was just because we've been having all these long form conversations where we've taken the time to have these conversations. And, you know, there's so many things that we can talk about that, that join our, our liberation struggles, not just here, like not just in those local elections, but they go, the principles of these systems exist geopolitically. And that is something that we often don't realize but like the principles of abolition the principles of everything that we've been talking about in this space as Kathy just pointed out are are a part of the whole system it's not just in one spot so when we see people from different communities reaching across and like having those conversations you will be surprised at the resonance that you will have um, I'm I'm actually Canadian, so I can't even vote if I wanted to in your spaces, but I'm often in your spaces because what's happening in the empire is affecting everybody. And so not only am I a Canadian, I'm a displaced Punjabi Sikh. So, you know, like that puts me in a very strange place because I'm not necessarily of here or there, but then there's this 
fantastic way in which we can understand that our struggles are so like multidimensional and yet so similar and you only find out through these conversations and so one of the things that like I just have to bring up from the farmers protests that happened in 2020 to 2021 where we saw 750 comrades die and many others brutalized <clears throat> where we saw the longest largest and most expensive protests happen in human history and you know one of the things that we let kind of like govern us was this idea of and what we thought about this was that, you know, what that means, sorry, is that like our youth is enraged and is aware and they know what's going on. And the only thing that keeps them at bay today is our elders. And our elders are holding us back with consciousness. And we can do so and be here in these protests and sit out here for a year and a half in the streets, setting up schools on those road streets. Like we, we did this for a year and a half and we still have so many resources going to teach kids, put them into schools, get people meals and that effort continues despite the fact that like we may not have gotten everything we wanted in that in that blow the consciousness that is there right now is leaving leading an abolitionist like protest ha happening right now the tarmi in saf morcha in punjab right now and it is on fire People are coherent, people are dis distinct. Like they, they're very, the same conversations you're having, they're having elsewhere. And I just wanted to bring you some resonance into that. And I'm very excited that you guys are here and, and getting together and having these calls. Um, just, I just wanted to reaffirm that. And um, as, a, as a Sikh diasporan, I will be in Chicago for the Socialism 2023 conference. And we'll be doing a number of events there as well, kind of hoping to connect with some of you, hopefully, and get um, the Sikh community kind of involved with uh, what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Sumit. We'll love to connect when you come down. Um, so Nicholas is next, and I think that'll be the the last uh, comment, or or um, and then uh, Lou's going to close us up. Go ahead, Nick. Right? Was it? Yeah, yeah. I'll be incredibly brief. Then uh, I just want to echo what Summer Jess said because you know uh, the Black Alliance for Peace is an international organization, and one thing that they said that I think is really important to highlight is that the struggles locally we have to tie to the international, right? Uh, police here are trained by Israeli, the IDF, right? So they they exchange information, right? The uh, the 1033 program transfers military grade equipment to our localities to be used like war zones. So war equipment is taken from the national level and put into the local level. So the imperialism we see, uh, a consequence of that is deprivation, violence, and destruction. But it's also immigration, right? People don't just immigrate, right? As the person that just spoke. Uh, talked about being a refugee. Uh, a cri the crisis of imperialism, which is the crisis of capitalism, results in migration. It results in the deprivation of our communities because they have to keep us at bay with their police force. And in the same tactics that they use in Africa, all throughout the continent, through the program of <clears throat> AFRICOM, right? They destabilize countries, they destroy the conditions to manifest and manufacture the conditions for terrorism, and then they have to go fight that terrorism. The same thing they do to the, the, the communities on my block, right? They'll create the conditions of poverty to create gangs, then to over-police you. It's the same tactic. So when we recognize that, that struggle is connected, uh, I think we can pull a lot from that. And I tell people all the time, like, there's no way to get out of this unless we fight imperialism, right? Even climate change. I talk to a lot of climate change activists, and they'll talk about going green, and that's important. But I tell you, if you went green, everything tomorrow, but 
the U.S. military still existed, uh, how much they pollute, we would not be able to undo the situation. We still have to, we have to demilitarize. And demilitarization means an anti-imperialist position, a staunch one. And I think one of my, one of my biggest beliefs is that in the West, what can be unifying, because there's a lot of division among the so-called left, is a completely anti-imperialist position. Don't talk about socialism and all that. We're not, we're not, we're not close enough to talk about how we're going to get socialism. But we can talk about how to be allies to our comrades in Palestine, to our comrades in the global south. So for me, that's super important to really take an anti-imperialist lens and do not, I think, capitulate, compromise, or concede to that position. Because that is uh, the, obliga the obligation of folks who live in the United States, who live in the West, the so-called West, the collective West that is demonizing, destroying, and exploiting everybody else. So if we are serious about capitalism, we got to be serious about imperialism and having that internationalist position, right? We've seen it in South Africa, and I'll end with this, that labor unified and refused to uh, undock shipments of weapons in South Africa during apartheid, right? Things like that have to happen, right? International solidarity looks like that, saying we're not going to ship weapons, we're not going to work, we're not going to work for defense uh, uh, manufacturers, we're not going to work for these weapon contractors. We got to start finding ways to be very creative and undermining U.S. imperialism and showing the rest of the globe that we're not just, you know, indifferent to the suffering. That in fact our suffering is connected, and we got to bond over that bondage and really break uh, what the U United States has put forward, which is their permanent war agenda and their uh, full spectrum dom dominance uh, political program. So I think anti-imperialism is one of the most important concepts of the 21st century. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> All right, Lou, you're up. Okay, well, it's, it's really amazing to have to close out this incredible uh, program. I want to say, first of all, was to thank everybody who came. We really appreciate this. We're going to be doing more of these things. We're going to ask you to do something, and that is to spread the word about the next event that we do. And I'll say a few more things about that momentarily. But we're going to ask you to do some publicity work to help promote this if you think this was a, a worthwhile endeavor this evening. And the last thing is to thank everyone we asked to be on the panel tonight. I hesitate to call it a panel. I want to call them conversationalists because that's what we attempted to accomplish here is to have a conversation among people who are in a position to be revolutionaries. The League is probably different from most other organizations recognizing that being a revolutionary today means that you're in the battle for basic needs which can't be met unless we have a total transformation of society. And that's what makes a person a revolutionary. And that is the position in which many people find themselves today. And I know that, that, um, that when Nicholas was talking about how the uh, Chicago coalition went about reaching for people, that's what they were talking, that's who they were talking to. They were talking to the people in the communities who were in that position of being objective revolutionaries, whether or not they believed they were or not. So we want to say that that this was an opportunity to draw some of those folks together. And, and we really had a, a, a great discussion, I think. Um, we hope to convene a the same or similar group in March so that we'll analyze and discuss the February 28th election and look at what's happening for the runoff election on April 4th. We'll be able to have a little bit more concrete discussion about that at that point, not much that we can say now. And then we hope to bring people back again in April when we will have had the final stage of the election, the second stage, the runoffs, we will know who the elected candidates are and we'll have a better sense of our possibilities or our doom as the case may be. But it will also give us again, more concrete things to say about how we're going to have to be out in the streets and what we're going to have to be doing to further the development of the movement at that point. Um, this program was brought to you by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. Our goal is to bring together people in the revolutionary movement 
to consider the tactical steps that are necessary to move forward in order to achieve a society where people thrive rather than struggle to survive, where private gain is supplanted by the distribution of the social product according to need. These tactical steps emerge in the fight for basic needs. And the electoral battles are one place where we see those fights take a political form. As I said at the beginning, we had two basic questions at the beginning of our planning for this meeting. One, how do we build a movement for basic needs within the electoral campaigns? And two, how do we, we prepare so the movement and the movements are stronger after the election rather than dissipated either by victory or defeat? We hope we've contributed to that tonight. We look forward to seeing you again in March and in April and beyond because we'll be continuing these kinds of discussions uh, further on down the road.